fourth Sunday after the Epiphany, O oh God, who knows us to be set in the midst of so many and great dangers, that by reason of the frailty of our nature we cannot always stand upright, grant to us such strength and protection as may support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, verse 2 of Epiphany Hymn 117. Cold on his cradle, the dew drop shining. Low lies his head with the breasts, beasts in the, of the stall. Angels adore him in slumber reclining. Maker and monarch, savior of all. Well, we now turn our attention to Roger of Wendover's Flowers of History comprising the history of England from the descent of the Saxons to 1235. It used to be ascribed to Matthew Paris, but I guess there's some uh, authorship issues that the historians raise. It's translated from the Latin. This is volume one. And so we'll be kind of roughly comparing the concept only and sense only comparison and contrast um, between this and Mary, Matthew uh, Venerable Bede, I should say. And even Matthew Paris from 1236, that period there, so understood Matthew Paris, uh, continue labors. Of the writer of this work entitled Flowers of History, we know a little more for certain, then that his name is Roger de Wendover, from which we may infer that he was a native of the town of Wendover in Buckinghamshire. Nothing is known of his birth or education or the time when he first embraced the monastic life in the Abbey of St. Albans. He rose to the rank of Precentor in the fraternity to which he belonged and was after were promoted to the rank of Prior of Belvoir a cell attached to St. Abbey's. It's probable that his promotion to this office took place in the reign of John, I think, the Magna Carta, since we are informed that he was deposed from it soon after the accession of Henry III. The cause of his degradation was alleged by Walter de Trumpington, 22nd Abbot of St. Albans, who deposed him to be that he had wasted the property of the house by his extravagance. The historian Matthew Paris, from whom we learn this fact, adds no further particulars than that he was recalled as St. Albans, Albans Abbey, where he died on 6th of May in the year 1237. The work for which Roger de Wendover is at present known, Flowers of History, contains an abridged history of the world from the creation to the year 1235, which was the 19th year of the king of Henry III. We may consider it as divided into three parts. In the first place comes all that portion of the work which precedes 447 BC, the year when Hengist and Horsa, with their Saxon followers, began first to be mentioned in the affairs of England. To all this portion of his work copied from Roman and Greek writers and from the romance of Geoffrey of Monmouth. Uh, not the slightest value is to be attached and by wise judgment of the editor of the original Latin text, it has been entirely excluded from the work. The second portion of Roger de Wendover's work being that which necessarily must have been compiled from other monastic chronicles extends from the year 447 to the year 1200. This portion is of great value, <clears throat> not as a work of original authority, for the writer was not contemporary with the events which happened during that interval, but because he has gathered his materials from original sources, many of which have since perished. 
independently also of this accidental circumstance, which gives value to this work, part of his work, it has another claim to be appreciated on account of the numbers of authors from whom Wendover has gleaned his information. Gemblor's Hermanus, Contractus, Marianus, Scotus, and the Byzantine historians, Theophanus, Serenius, Bede, William of Malsbury, Florence of Worcester, and Henry of Huntington have all supplied materials for the flowers of history, which thus may be considered as an abstract of all preceding events. But notwithstanding these reasons for attaching value to the second division of Wendover's work, we shall not be wrong in asserting that by far the most important part of his history is that which treats of his own times, in relating the events which happened in his own day during the 50 years preceding 1235, he rises into the character of an original writer. But the most curious point connected with Wendover and his writings remains still to be told. It is well known that the monastic historians were in the habit of copying largely from one another, and no discredit has ever been thrown on them for doing so. Every monastery had its chronicler, whose duty it was to record the events of the day. When a history or chronicle of past events was copied for the use of the brethren, or to be sent out into the world, it was an obvious proceeding to bring down the narrative to the time of the writer. The form also into which nearly all the old chronicles were thrown, appearing more likely as a chronological table than a history, well favored this practice. A new writer, moreover, did not hesitate to copy or abridge ad libitum the work of his predecessor, and in some cases, in consequence of this practice, the original disappeared altogether from existence. This would have been the case with Roger de Wendover, were it not for the curious fact that the very copy of his work, which Matthew Paris, his continuator, used as a basis for his own more extended labors, is still in existence. From an inspection of this manuscript and in comparison with other copies, of Matthew Paris's own history. It appears that the latter writer embodied Roger de Wendover verbatim in his own work, altering occasionally a single sentence or adding a few paragraphs of his own. The original work of Roger de Wendover has been lately edited by the Reverend H. O. Cox of the Bodleian Library for the English Historical Society. <coughs> From the text of that edition, the present translation has been made. I've done my best to give the English reader, for the first time, a faithful idea of the Latin original, and I leave it to his judgment to determine both the value of the chronicle itself and with what success I've discharged my task of translating it. J.A. Giles, Bampton, 1848. Roger of Wendover's History Preface. Here begins the preface to the book in, in titled titled Flowers of History. We thought it good briefly to note the chief events of the past times and to give the lineage of our saviors from the beginning which the successions of certain kingdoms of the world and their rulers for the instruction of posterity and to aid the diligence of the student, studious hearer. But first we will address a word to certain dull cavillers who ask what need there is of recording men's lives and deaths of the various chances which befall them, or of committing the writing of different prodigies of heaven, earth, and elements. Now, we would have such persons know that the lives of good men in times past are set forth for the imitation of succeeding times, and that the examples of evil men, when such occur, are not to be followed, but to be shunned. Moreover, the prodigies and portentous occurrences of past days, 
whether in the way of pestilence or in other chastisements of God's wrath, are not without admonition to the faithful. Therefore is the memory of them committed to writing, that if ever shall the like occur again, men may presently betake themselves to repentance, and by this remedy appease the divine vengeance. For this cause, therefore, among many others, Moses the lawgiver sets forth in the sacred history the innocence of Abel, the envy of Cain, the sincerity of Job, the dissimulation of Esau, the malice of the eleven of the sons of Israel, the goodness of Joseph, the twelfth, the punishment of the five cities and their destruction by fire, to the end that we may imitate the good and carefully turn from the ways of the wicked. And this not only does Moses, but also the writers of the sacred page, who by commending virtue and holding up vice to detestation, invite us to the love and fear of God. They are therefore especially not they are therefore not to be heeded who say that the book of Chronicles, especially those by Catholic authors, are unworthy of regard, and through them whatever is necessary for human wisdom and salvation. The studious inquirer may be able to set to be able to acquire by his memory, apprehend by his learning, and set forth by his eloquence. The following work, then, is divided into two books, the first of which treats briefly of the Old Testament of the law of God through five ages of the world under the coming of the Savior, as the same mark, as, as the same are marked by Moses, the lawgiver, with the successions of the kings of the Gentiles and of their kingdoms, without which the law of God could not conveniently be set forth. For Luke, the evangelist, in writing the Gospel of Christ, made mention of Tiberius Caesar, and the kings of the Jewish nation, whose days and years were well known to all, to the end that the advent of the Savior among men and all his works, which were of lowly origin, might come to the knowledge of all, by means of that which had more splendor and notoriety. And this indeed was the way of almost all the writers of the sacred page for the reasons above mentioned. The second book of this work treats of the New Testament commencing with the incarnation of Christ and his nativity and notices every year with omitting one down to our times on whom the ends of the world are come, of which we will treat of more largely in its proper place. Nevertheless, for the sake of fastidious readers who are easily wearied, who think it good to aim at brevity in our history, to this end, that while they experience a light, short, and pleasing narration, we may kindle in their minds a love of reading, that which does not weary, and from listless hearers and fastidious readers, convert them into diligent students. Finally, that which follows has been taken from the books of Catholic writers worthy of credit, just as the flowers of various colors are gathered from the various fields, to the end that the very variety noted in the diversity of colors may be grateful to the various minds of the readers, and by presenting some which each may relish for the profit and entertainment of all. Thus ends the preface. Preface to the second book. The second book of this work, commencing with the time of grace, treats of the nativity of our Savior and of his works in the flesh, of the calling of the apostles and of the saints now glorified in heaven, arranged according to the years of incarnation, without omitting one down to our times on whom the ends of the world are come in the course of which it treats all the Roman pontiffs and emperors. It treats, moreover, of archbishops, bishops, and other dignities of the church, of kings and princes and other great men, who in their times lived in different regions, and of their acts, whether good or evil. It treats, moreover, of the various chances that have befallen 
mankind, the prodigious and portentous manifestation of God's wrath, to the end that, being admonished by past evils, men may betake themselves to humiliation and repentance by example of the imitation from the good and shining the ways of the perverse. Here ends the second preface. Roger of Wendover's Flowers of History, the Causes of Inviting the Angles. In the year 447, when the nations around had become acquainted with the wickedness of King Vortigern and the levity of his mind, there rose up against him the Scots from the northwest and the Picts from the north. because Vortigern had put to death a hundred of their countrymen, and terribly did they infest and ravage the kingdom of Britain. For consuming everything by fire and sword, by spoil and rapine, they inflicted on the guilty nation the vengeance of heaven for the sins of their king in which they participated. And those of the wretched people that escaped the hostile invasion fell the victims of a terrible famine, insomuch that the living were not sufficient for the burial of the dead. Whereupon the king and his people, desolated and worn out by the ravages of war, and not knowing what to do with the incursions of their enemies, at length came to the unanimous re resolution of inviting over from beyond the sea the Saxon nation to their help the effect, as it would seem, of the divine appointment that evil may come, come upon them for their wickedness, as indeed was made but too manifest by the event. Meanwhile, messengers are dispatched into Germany to effect their purpose. Note that not by might, but virtue is the stay in war. In the year of 448, the pick and Scots with united forces attacked the Britons who deeming themselves unequal to the contest employed the aid of the holy bishops Germanus and Lupus at length when the greater part of their forces was preparing to arm for war Germanus declares that he will be their leader a bishop he selects the most active reconnoiters the country round about and finding a valley encompassed with hills in a way by which it was expected that the enemy would approach, he there draws up his inexperienced troops, himself acting as their general. And now intelligence is brought by their scouts that a vast multitude of their fierce enemies is approaching. Whereupon Germanus commanded his men to respond with one shout to his voice, and then the three priests, the priests three times cried, Hallelujah, on which one voice bursts forth from the whole multitude, and a deafening shout ascends to heaven, the air reverberating the sound. The hostile army, smitten with terror in their fear, believe that not only is the surrounding rocks, but also the very skies were coming down upon them and their feet were not swift enough to deliver them from their terror. The flight becomes general. They cast away their arms, well satisfied if with their naked bodies they can escape the danger. Numbers in their precipitate flight were swallowed up in a repassing river. The Britons, without having slain a man, behold the vengeance inflicted on their foes, and are passive spectators of the victory. The spoils of the field are collected, and the devout soldier rejoices in the victory which heaven had given. The bishops triumph in the overthrow of the enemy without bloodshed, and the victory is the more glorious for having been obtained not by might, but by faith. Uh, footnote, the Saxons did not arrive in England all at one time, as is generally supposed, but in different and unconnected bodies and at different periods, expend, extending over the space of more than a hundred years. The island being reduced to peace and security by 
the overthrow of its foes, both invisible and carnal, the prelates prepare to return home. Their own merits and the intercession of the blessed martyr Elben. So we've got a saint invoker here. Obtain for them a trank, you know, that's just an insult to the sovereign Jesus. <clears throat> Obtain for them a tranquil passage and happy vessel. Restored them in peace to their rejoicing people. This was in the 10th year of Merovius, king of the Franks. On the arrival of the Angles into Britain and of their country and leaders, in the year of 449, the nation of the Angles or Saxons being ordered, invited over by the king Vortigern, arrive in Britain in three ships of war and had a place assigned them by the king in the eastern part of the island to dwell in on the terms that they should fight for the peace and safety of the kingdom against the enemy that the Britons should furnish them with sufficient petty. Now those who came over belonged to three of the more powerful nations of Germany, the Saxons, Angles, and Jutes. From the Jutes are descended from, from the Jutes are descended the people of Kent and of the Isle of Wight, as also the people in the province of West Saxons over against the Isle of Wight, who to this day are called Jutes. From the Saxons, whose original country is now called Old Saxony, came East Saxons, South Saxons, West Saxons. From the Angles, whose country is called Anglia, and is said to have remained desert from that time to this day, are descended the East Angles, the Midland Angles, the Mercians, the whole race of the Northumbrians who live to the north of the River Humber and the rest of the nations of the Angles. Their leaders are said to have been two brothers, Hengist and Horsa, sons of Wickthgisius, the son of Wicks, the son of Wecta, the son of Woden, and from whose stocks the royal families of many provinces deduce their origin. When at length they stood before the king, he asked them respecting the faith and religion of their ancestors, on which Hengst replied, We worship the gods of our fathers, Saturn, Jupiter, and the other deities who govern the world, and especially Mercury, Mercury, whom in our tongue we call Woden, and to whom our fathers dedicated the fourth day of the week, which to this day is called Woden's Day. Merovius is supposed to have been present at the battle at which Attila was defeated by Aetius, he died, according to Siegbert, in 458. The Saxons landed at Eb, Ebb's fleet in the Isle of Thanet, Thanet. To him we worship the most powerful goddess of Freya, to whom they dedicate the sixth day, which after her we call Friday. I grieve much, said Vortigern, for your belief, or rather your unbelief, but I am exceedingly rejoiced at your coming whether brought about by God or otherwise, is most opportune for my urgent necessities. For I am pressed by my enemies on every side, and if you will share with me the toil of fighting, you shall remain in my kingdom, wherein ye shall be had in honor and enriched with lands and possessions. The barbarian straightway assented, having made a league with him, remained at his court. The same year, it became known that by means of a few individuals, the Pelagian heresy was again spreading in Britain, whereupon the Britons again send their entreaties unto the most blessed Germanus that he would vouchsafe to undertake the cause of God in the conduct of spiritual contest. Joyfully yielding to their request and taking with him Severus, a man of perfect sanctity, who had been a disciple of the most blessed father, Lupus, who was then ordained bishop of trees. Treves, he put to sea, or Trevis, and by favor of the elements made a safe passage to Britain. There by his preaching he admonished the people to correct their errors, and by the judgment of all, the authors of the heresy were condemned. 
where, whereby it was kept pure and uncorrupted in these parts, having well settled everything, the blessed priests return home as prosperously as they came. How King Vortigern, being provoked to war, conquered the enemy with the assistance of the Saxons. In the year 450, after the departure of the most blessed bishops from Britain, the Scots and Picts emerging from the northern parts after their customs, custom with an immense force began to ravage the north of the island. On receiving intelligence thereof, Vortigan collected his troops and crossed the Humber to meet them. But there was not much need of the natives fighting in their footnote. <clears throat> the story of St. Germanus is attended with such difficulties that I have no hesitation in rejecting altogether the importance which is generally attached to it by ecclesiastical historians. He is said to have been accompanied in his first mission by Lupus, Bishop of Troyes, and in his second by Severus, Archbishop of Treves. For the Saxons, back to the narrative, for the Saxons who were with him fought so manfully that in an instance they routed the enemy, who before their arrival had become habituated to the conquest. Having gained the victory by their aid, Vortigern was more lavish with his gifts and bestowed on Hanks, their leader, extensive lands in the division of Lindsay, wherewith to sustain himself and his comrades. But Hengus, being a cunning man and having gained the king's friendship, addressed him in these terms. My lord, thy enemies vex thee on all sides. Say they will depose thee and bring Aurelius Ambrosius from Amorica and make him king in thy room. If it please thee, therefore, let us send into our country and invite over more soldiers that our number may be increased. The king accordingly agreed to the proposal and bade him send into Germany for speedy aid. Straightway messengers were dispatched into Germany who brought back with them 18 vessels of chosen soldiers. They brought over Hengist's daughter named Rowena, Rowena, by whose beauty Vortigern was so captivated that he demanded her of her father in marriage. Hengist, thus fully satisfied of the levity of the king's mind, readily gave him his daughter. Whereupon Satan entered into his heart, and as much as, being a Christian, he sought a union with a pagan. The king married her the same night and delighted in her beyond measure. But by this step he incurred the enmity of his nobles and sons, for he had three sons by another wife, Vortimer, Catagern, and Pascentius. He also had a daughter by the same wife, whom he took to his bed, and had by her a son, for which he was excommunicated by St. Germanus and the whole synod of bishops. The death the same year as St. Sigisbert writes in his chronicle, St. Germanus went to Ravenna for the good of the Amorican people after being received with utmost respect by Valentinian and his mother Placidia, he departed to Christ. Geoffrey of Monmouth, a footnote, tells us that Vortigan gave Hengst as much land as could be surrounded with a bull's hide. Hence is thought to have been derived the name of Thongaster, situated according to Camden, about six miles from Grisby, so remarkable a similarity between this story and that of Dido leads the reader to infer that one story is as probable as the other. And it is here we will um, call it to an end. Interesting. Christianity, 150 years before Augustine the Lesser sets foot in Canterbury. Dover. Hymn 117, Epiphany Hymn. Shall we then yield him in costly devotion, odors of Edom, offerings divine, gems of the mountain, pearls of the ocean, myrrh from the forest, and gold from the mine? Let us pray. 
blessing and honor, glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, to the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. Godspeed.